The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Peter Clark. This is Ear to Asia. So in Australia, it appears that things have quietened down in terms of the dynamic of politics and how Muslims are no longer a major focus. But in terms of the war on terror, unfortunately, that link between external events and how people will be regarded will be a constant theme, I think, in the contingency of where one sits and how one's regarded and the question of inclusion within Australian society. I think the way forward would be to move away from othering Muslims to de-othering Muslims, which means that we have to start thinking about people in this country as all belonging to the nation state and that when we begin to isolate individual communities and start to otherize them, we are not solving anyone's problem. In this episode... The Legacy of the War on Terror for Muslims in the West. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialists at the University of Melbourne. With the rising popularity of far-right political parties and figures in Western liberal democracies, Australia's security focus is shifting away from Islamic terrorism the primary concern after the 9-11 and subsequent extremist attacks on Western targets towards white supremacists and the far right. This change comes around two decades after the Australian government enacted some of the strictest counter-terrorism measures in the Western world in response to 9-11 and in support of George W. Bush's War on Terror. These measures, as well as Australia's involvement in the invasion and subsequent occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq, took a heavy toll on Muslim communities who bore the brunt of these policy shifts. In Australia and elsewhere, constant surveillance of domestic Muslim communities bred fear, anxiety and self-censorship, while mainstream media outlets were free to amplify stereotypes with little accountability. So, how has living under the shadow of the war on terror influenced how Muslims see themselves and their place in Western societies? What impact has this environment of suspicion and fear had on the generation of young Muslims who came of age during this period? And what steps can and should be taken to repair the damage of the past two decades? With me to discuss the legacy of the war on terror on the lives of Muslims in Australia and other Western nations are researchers of Muslim societies in the West. Professor Michael Humphrey from the University of Sydney and Dr. Jan Ali from Western Sydney University. Michael and Jan, welcome to Ear to Asia. Thank you. Thank you. As an opening gambit, Michael, and I'll come to you in a moment, Jan, What is your general overview of how Muslims were perceived by Australian citizens and how they perceived themselves in the Australian society before the 9-11 terrorist attacks in the USA and after? What were the key shifts in those perceptions? Michael. Well, I mean, I think the key shifts are in the context of immigrant societies in which Muslim communities from different countries saw themselves as members of diverse multicultural societies in which they were coming with the expectations of migration, of a better life, opportunities for children. And then in the context of ethnic politics was rapidly kind of overturned with the 9-11 event because, you know, it was experienced as a global event. And suddenly Muslims as a kind of collective identity were transformed from immigrant communities to a kind of a homogenized other and potential threat. So it was a radical shake-up. John, your overview, and just bearing in mind listening to Michael then, there were many tributaries feeding into that relabeling, if you like, including, as I alluded to a moment ago, George W. Bush's war on terror. How do you see those key shifts? Yeah, I think I concur with Michael. Uh, The original immigrants to Western societies, for instance, to Australia, where Muslims migrated, they basically arrived in these Western countries, including Australia, for a better life. And so they were actually participating, if you like, uh, in this multicultural society 
which was presented to them as a as a kind of a paradisical country if you like or place and that uh, was totally changed with the events of September 11 where they became targets of political leaders and uh, media journalists and policy makers whilst muslims generally have been migrating into western countries as ethnic groups and therefore separate entities was suddenly lumped into a single collectivity as one homogenous group which actually was problematic because muslims are generally from different ethnic and parochial backgrounds including different sectarian and ideological backgrounds as well and so lumping them together was going against reality so to speak and that was hugely problematic and i think that continues to happen even today john keeping that before and after lens on how fertile were the fields within our society for the sowing of those seeds of the labeling or relabeling do you think I think Muslims have always been the other from a Western perspective. We can go all the way to uh, Crusades. Uh, But I think the um, Afghanistan invasion and the invasion of Iraq subsequently made Muslims more of a target now than before. And the landscape has changed for them uh, dramatically in recent years. Michael, your take on that, and I'm just thinking as I'm listening to John, that the increase in foregrounding Christianity, even amongst our leaders like Kevin Rudd and Tony Abbott, etc., what other elements do you see being part of those tributaries moving into, flowing into the shifting of perceptions? I mean, I started work, um, you know, as an academic researcher in the late 70s on Muslim communities arriving in Australia. Um, And the perspective then was, very different. And I mean, it really was very different in different parts of the world. In Europe, of course, there was a kind of colonial relationship, especially Britain and France. But in Australia, that relationship didn't exist. And, you know, the largest communities at that point were people from Turkey, not only Turks, but also Kurds, arriving as essentially a kind of an extension of migrant labor programs and Lebanese coming from the civil war. And so the questions at that point were much more the kind of integration of migrants in the context of a kind of acceptance, a greater acceptance of diversity. So, you know, 9-11, the impact of 9-11 kind of brought a kind of Middle East politics and external events into the community in a way that dramatically revealed the contingency of the process of settlement in a country like Australia. In other words, they were no longer really in control of the major factors that would determine how they were going to be seen and the terms under which they were going to be accepted in the society. Was Australia at that time, before 9-11, essentially perceived by most citizens as a secular society, or was that really an illusion and it really was primarily a Christian society or a Christian-based society? I think this religious emphasis is a much more of a post-9-11 kind of perspective because, you know, multiculturalism, in a sense, was a pushback against the kind of priority of a white Anglo-Saxon Christian kind of culture and to accept the kind of reality of the diversity of the population that was arriving in Australia and increasingly growing and becoming, you know, extremely kind of diverse. And in Australia, I mean, while certain political leaders may have emphasised their Christianity, it hasn't been the major kind of theme of politics, not like in the United States. So here it was perceived as a secular society in a sense, an open society, and that was in a sense the opportunity of multiculturalism was to allow that diversity. And John, I've been putting the emphasis just as an opening contextualising on religion, but of course it's intertwined, isn't it, obviously with uh, cultural practices and differing cultural expressions of Islam in Australia and around the world, of course. So how important is that intertwining of culture in terms of even obvious things like hijab and full facial coverings, etc., from differing cultural groups? How important were those cultural contributions within the religion? 
Yeah, I think they were important during early migration, and we're talking about 30, 40 years ago, but that definitely is changing both in Western countries as well as in Muslim-majority countries where what we might call cultural Islam is being countered by what we might call scriptural Islam under the guise of a revivalism or religious revivalism. And what we see now is a kind of dichotomy between cultural Islam and scriptural Islam or revived Islam. And the revived Islam is very much a product of young Muslims who are now more educated and actually have access to religious texts and materials. And of course, with the benefit of education, are able to move away from cultural Islam to more scriptural based Islam. And you will find that especially the um, young Muslims, both men and women are moving towards that. And you mentioned about hijab. That is one manifestation of that, if you like, scriptural Islam or revived Islam. And I think that kind of trajectory is forever more intensifying in contemporary period. More and more men and women are moving towards that kind of religious practice than what we might call cultural Islam. So certain things that were considered to be alien to Islam but entered into Islam as Islamic practice have been now counted particularly by educated class, if you like. Let's together now examine that Australian legislative response after 9-11 that I alluded to in my opening. Within months of 9-11, the Australian government enacted a raft of counter-terrorism measures, which some analysts describe as the most rigid, the most stringent in a Western democracy. So, Michael, just summarise for us what are the hallmark characteristics of those countermeasures, both then and as they've evolved? Yeah, well, I mean, counterterrorism as a, as a kind of way of framing a crime or potential crime or prevention of crime, you know, shifts the focus of, you know, kind of prosecutions of criminal acts, things that have been done to things that may happen or a kind of people have the intention of um, kind of committing. So, you know, the focus of these laws becomes how to find out people who might, you know, kind of be planning or might have the intention to commit these crimes. And what happened with the kind of legislation was, you know, it extended notions of traditional criminal responsibility, granted intrusive powers to police and intelligence agencies, limited media reporting in the public interest, and allowed for secretive trials. And between 2001 and 2021, there's some 92 counterterrorism laws that have been enacted. So it is certainly a huge amount of legislation to address these. Uh, these laws are not just an Australian initiative. You know, uh, the kind of homogenization of Muslims is also kind of reflected in the kind of harmonization of counterterrorism laws. And many Australian laws are reflected, uh, particularly UK law in the process of internationally coordinating I mean, the policing, the kind of intelligence, all these things become part of a new kind of development of a national security state and kind of harmonisation of judicial processes. So it's fair to say the, the hallmarks were largely pre-crime or having an intention to commit a terrorist crime. That They were some of the key characteristics of the legislation as it came forward. That's right. And, and in fact, if you look at the prosecutions that occurred in the first decade and the second decade, overwhelmingly the in the first decade, there were prosecutions for the intention to foil, to prevent. And there was only, I think, two people convicted of terrorist crimes, which was the kind of Parramatta incident where a police accountant Chang was murdered by a young Muslim. And so overwhelmingly, yeah, these laws have been about intention and planning and prevention. So, John, as you look back now and today as well, look at the landscape of that evolving counter-terrorist legislation in Australia, what are the main things that stand out for you? Well, <laughs> I do acknowledge that uh, the um, policymakers and the lawmakers had uh, the intention of I suppose curbing terrorism happening in Australia and therefore enacting laws. But I think given the context, uh, although the lawmakers, policymakers, politicians would 
have us believe that it was not necessarily targeting a particular group, such as Muslims, but in fact, it originated or emanated from the 9-11 context. So we cannot deny that. And therefore, the obvious characteristic of these countermeasures were to target or were targeting Muslims and their faith in an attempt to securitize Muslims. And some of my colleagues and I actually argue that the acts that took place under the guise of terror would quite easily pass for uh, criminal acts and should have been prosecuted under that or under those acts. But again, there was a political interest uh, in doing so and also Western countries aligning with each other and most importantly aligning with the superpower hegemony like America. And that was only obvious on the part of Australia to do so. Michael, I guess we can garner some of the rhetoric that we heard from politicians at that time as the legislation was being forged and and put into place. We get clues as to what they were thinking. But what's your analysis of what were the key triggers and what were they responding to essentially? Well, you know, John Howard kind of expressed it pretty well at the time. The fact that he was in Washington, D.C. during the attacks in the World Trade Center and then in Washington made him identify very closely with the U.S. and U.S. response to that. But the actual construction of it, of terrorism, has had real consequences in terms of the the way laws have been written, uh, you know, counterterrorism laws have been written, and the idea that these are not just criminal acts, but kind of acts committed by people who are ideologically motivated, meaning they are likely to be recidivists. And so the aim of um, this prosecution, especially in the United States, has been directed at incapacitating, in other words, prevention, um, incapacitating people convicted of terrorism offences by long jail sentences, um, rather than a focus on rehabilitation. That really is a kind of a very clear contrast between normal criminal kind of um, convictions and current convictions for terrorist offences. So the harshness, uh, the severity, I mean, that Jan was pointing to, um, relates to how individuals have been constructed or what their behaviour represents as acts committed under these laws, against these laws. Of course, the other dimension, and you know, one is the the kind of uh, rhetoric of President Bush, you know, good and bad Muslims, you're either with us or against us. All this kind of consolidated a kind of a Western perception of them being under attack, and that's precisely what John Howard said. You know, they're against us too. You know, we're all kind of targets, and for for John Howard, of course, that was only emphasised in the Bali attacks in 2002 by a J.I., which was at the time seen as an al-Qaeda franchise in Southeast Asia. So, you know, that really re- brought home to Australians uh, the idea that, you know, we are under attack and and therefore this kind of homogenization of a group as representing evil within that rhetoric of counterterrorism was, you know, entirely politically, I suppose, uh, powerful, I, you know, being tough on terrorism, and so that in that kind of context of anxiety and insecurity, politicians made use of it, you know, for their own political kind of interests. Can I add one point? Uh, uh, Michael mentioned this earlier, is that in pre-9-11 era, intention wasn't a major focus. If you intended to do a criminal act, wasn't a major focus. However, in post-9-11 era, particularly when it came to Muslims, intention became a very important point of prosecution and criminalization. So intention became criminalized. And for Muslims, what happened is that a Muslim suddenly became guilty by the virtue of the fact that he or she is a Muslim and subscribed to Islam, and he or she then have to prove his or her innocent it totally made a 360 degree 10, which I think is hugely problematic in terms of uh, laws and regulations. And as I heard Michael allude again to the good Muslim, bad Muslim binary that uh, Bush put forward, that's 
obviously just on prima facie very problematic, isn't it? Because what we saw happening then was the requirement that Australian Muslims enter into denunciations, justify themselves. So you have to prove almost daily that you're a good Muslim in various ways. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Are you a good Muslim if you rub shoulders with Westerners and participate in their values and, and rituals and practices? But if you are kind of excluding yourself and being part of your own enclave to communities and also practicing your religion, then obviously you are the other and the enemy. So yes, <laughs> that's usually problematic because a lot of Muslims who do practice their religion, obviously by the virtue of the fact that the religion teaches many great values and moral and ethical practices and virtues, then it's totally rejected because you are no longer part of us, but on your own or part of a different enemy group. Michael, surveillance, and that continues to this day, quite stringent surveillance. Uh, what has been the impact, do you believe, on the Muslim societies uh, around Australia by this intense surveillance? Well, I mean, uh, surveillance has been kind of a central part of counterterrorism. And when we've talked about the laws, um, but of course, that also involved uh, kind of active involvement and kind of the experience of people with the laws and the potential for, you know, detention, secret detention for seven days or not being able to communicate anything associated with any investigation or interrogations made everything very kind of anxiety producing. And, you know, if you look at things like, you know, parliamentary joint committee reports on various aspects of these laws, say in 2005, as you know, questioning and detention powers, you know, the communities expressed concerns about the way that they were undermining civil liberties and their democratic rights, uh, denied their right to silence. Uh, in fact, it was criminal if you kind of withheld information. Discriminatory laws seen as targeting one community, excessive secrecy. So, I mean, the nature of surveillance was also the kind of uncertainty and just simply not knowing what it meant uh, to come under scrutiny and what consequences it might have. You know, at the community level also, I mean, relating to what we were talking about before, counterterrorism and, and stereotyping and this kind of idea of good and bad or you know, moderate or extremist was the attempt by police and intelligence to work with the community to keep it safe. But, but that also had the effect of cleavage between those who were with us and those who were against us. So, you know, was it a kind of an expression of support and loyalty? Again, the idea that you constantly had to prove that you were on their side and whether or not, you know, their perceptions or concerns were valid or how they were reading or misreading or how they were essentializing certain kind of aspects of Islam or attributing certain meaning to symbols, which is hijab. I mean, in places like France, the hijab became a symbol of radicalism as a consequence of the civil war in Algeria and GIA and their acts in, in France. So, you know, those symbols become very broadly appropriated and used as political weapons. John, your take on that? Yeah, I think surveillance or security measures, counter-terror measures, I think were taken under the pretext of a risk minimization. And that was to basically manage Muslims in such a way that any act of terror would not happen. And so the um, political authorities and policymakers went on to doing certain things with the community, Muslim communities, and also in terms of other activities. So working with the community, encouraging this whole idea of moderating Islam in the community and encouraging sheikhs and imams to preach moderate Islam. This idea of de-radicalization of Muslim youths, even this idea of secularization of Islam were all part of this risk minimization. And government spent a lot of money in these kind of measures or initiatives with de-radicalization programs, providing community with funding to engage in de-radicalization. I mean, I, I teach Islamic studies at Western Sydney University, which is very much a product of that in the sense that 
with the 2007 Cronulla riots when John Howard was Prime Minister. He funded the centre to um, actually bring in uh, Islamic studies in certain universities, Melbourne, Griffith and Western Sydney. And that was very much part and parcel of this whole idea of uh, moderating Islam in Australia and encouraging particularly the preachers and teachers of Islam to practice uh, moderate Islam, whatever that may mean. And so, yeah, uh, basically all this, what I've said, was part and parcel of risk minimization. Now, John, one could assume that uh, with that severe threat from outside a community, the Muslim community, that there'd be increased solidarity. And I'm sure that's what evolved and that's what happened in many ways. But within the communities, were there also fissures created? We, you've just been alluding to moderate versus extreme and all that sort of thing. And the, and the variability across the community and fed by various cultures as well within the, the multicultural community. So were there fissures within the communities as well that aroused suspicion of other members of that community? I haven't seen evidence, uh, empirical evidence, to suggest that the parochialized uh, or ethnicized Muslim communities came together uh, when such legislations were enacted. Uh, I don't think that there was any attempt by community heads to bring Muslim communities together. What did happen, I would say, is that a lot of community organization heads started engaging with the state in a variety of ways to participate in these initiatives. But as far as identifying culprits, I don't think that that really, <laughs> really took off. Michael, your comments on that? I'm just listening to John there thinking of the corollary, that human psychology where within a group under great stress and under stringent conditions, including legislation, there there might be a tendency within that group to say, well, prove you're one of us or are you one of them? The corollary of the, the good Muslim, bad Muslim thing. There would be that dynamic. But I think one point to emphasize is that, you know, Islamic institutions and community organizations were evolving over that period. And the response of, you know, many states after 9-11 was to try to cultivate uh, national Islam. So, you know, an Australian Islam, a French Islam, a British Islam. And so the processes of involvement and community, trying to keep the community safe and, and, and liaison was part of a kind of domestication of those institutions. You know, historically, mosques uh, in Australia had evolved from very small kind of communities who gathered around each other in various locations in the major cities and built their own institutions. And the diversity of those institutions actually brought about an attempt to consolidate and kind of integrate and, if you like, kind of authorise, for example, the accreditation of imams as a process of bringing those kind of institutions together into a more kind of structured and both bureaucratic kind of organisation. So sure, within that process, there would be a tension between whose side you were on and whether you were you're loyal or whether, you know, what was Islamic or not Islamic. I mean, that that is part of the extremely controversial moment uh, where radical groups, Islamist groups, keep on wanting to appropriate the legitimacy of their particular interpretation. So, yeah, I mean, that dynamic is going to be there in terms of the politicisation of religion. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Peter Clark, and I'm joined by researchers of Muslim societies, Dr. Jan Ali and Professor Michael Humphrey. The dimension we've barely touched on so far is the whole concept of and practice of Australian citizenship and that oath of 
citizenship one takes when uh, one's naturalised in Australia. If you're not born here, you are naturalised. So citizenship, its very character, its dimensions, that's all part of this, isn't it, Michael? Well, yes, but what is more poignant is the whole issue of uh, the Australian government establishing laws and being able to strip Australian citizenship of those with dual nationality. I mean, that was the ultimate kind of statement about the contingency of your integration and membership within the society, even if you were born here. John, citizenship, take that a bit further. Sure. I mean, stripping of uh, Muslim citizenship was and has been, I suppose, a part and parcel of this risk minimization uh, in the context of terrorism. So, yes, citizenship has become a kind of a political football when it comes to Muslim citizenship. And stripping Muslims of their citizenship is a way of keeping the threat away not eradicating it, but away from Australia. So let's say, for instance, uh, a particular individual has been uh, convicted of terror attacks or intending to commit an act of terror and is a dual citizen, you would like to then strip off his or her citizenship and return them to their uh, original place of birth. So that's shifting away the terror or the threat of terror away from your own country and moving it to another place. So citizenship uh, has become a very uh, malleable, if you like, when it comes to Muslims. So notions that we've heard like uh, grateful or not, uh, deserving or not, and being worthy or not, and, and who actually makes those judgments and those appraisals. Michael? Yeah, I look, I mean, this idea of the contingency of citizenship and kind of recognition and inclusion has to be put in the context of what's happened over 20 years since 9-11. You know, there are two dimensions to counterterrorism policy, which Australia got involved in. One was what we've been talking about, domestic policy, both laws and kind of approaches to incorporation of community as a strategy. The other is the wars overseas, defeat terrorism, where it's produced. And of course, you know, Afghanistan was one and then the kind of trick to transfer to Iraq. Now, I mean, the consequence of that has been rather than prevent more Islamist movements and, and more, even more radical forms of Islamic terrorism and action in, in the West has failed. And so when we talk about, you know, the stripping of the dual citizenship and the stripping of Australian citizenship, this really happened in the context of ISIS and the recruitment of people in from Western countries or young Muslims from Western countries to go and kind of join the great millenarian kind of movement of transformation of some particular region under the caliphate into some kind of ideal Islamic society. So the contingency of these situations has been caught up in the dynamic between the policy of trying to defeat terrorism overseas, you know, in Afghanistan and all the counterterrorism operations that are still going on in, in parts of Africa and, and the Middle East, and the kind of impact of the policies on communities here who have a relationship, either direct or indirect, to those events. That seems a good moment then, as you describe that, to very briefly compare what happened here in Australia a long, long way away from New York and Washington, D.C., with how the United States itself enacted counterterrorism legislation. What were the key features of what they did in terms of legislation and the execution of it? How were those measures similar to what happened in Australia and how did they fundamentally differ within that federal republic and then within that U.S. democracy? Michael? Of course, the key legislation was the Patriot Act, focused on what was called terrorism enhancement and material support laws. I mean, the construction of Muslims and particularly the attackers in 9-11, because, I mean, it was a huge shock in the United States. I mean, the attack on particularly the World Trade Center was to see them as the enemy of freedom, kind of involved in the murder of innocence, and really demonize them as kind of an expression of evil. Now, the approach to criminalization was to really enhance punishment, prosecution and punishment as a measure of 
basically taking potential terrorists or people involved in acts of terrorism off the street, put them in prison for a very, very, very long time. So the intention to commit an act of terrorism was treated as if you'd actually committed the crime and you'd end up with 35 years to life for a crime that might otherwise, as a normal criminal act, only attract five years in term of imprisonment. So, I mean, it was a very harsh response to kind of anybody convicted under those laws. And again, this idea we made the point before about the approach to these people convicted under terrorism laws as recidivists, and it was more important to incapacitate them than to think you could rehabilitate them. And, you know, even in Australia, we've had that happen. People who've served sentences for terrorism have been kept in jail beyond the term. Now, the other dramatic kind of events that have happened is the London bombings in 2005 and the kind of increasing consciousness that it wasn't about keeping people out of the country, you know, potential terrorists, but also the problem of what they call homegrown terrorism, the threat of terrorism within communities, uh, you know, arising from within communities and people being attracted to or radicalised online. And I just can't help but recall, because Michael mentioned the London bombings, the Bali bombings and our nearest neighbour, or one of our nearest neighbours, Indonesia, a very large neighbour and Muslim majority. John, how did the Bali bombings play into these scenarios? Uh, Yeah, I think it played a very important role because apart from anything else, what happened at uh, Bali is that a lot of Australians were killed. And so that made Bali bombing an Australian problem, if you like, or a problem for Australia and needed to be addressed, I suppose, in the way that Australia saw fit. And I think the, the parallel is, again, between Australia and US is that You know, George W. Bush says that we will deal with these uh, criminals in our way. And I think that kind of attitude was also replicated here in Australia that we will bring these people to justice. And I think there was huge political um, pressure on Indonesia to prosecute the Bali bombers. And some of them definitely got the death penalty. So these programs, which uh, have been instituted both in Australia and in the United States, CVE, Countering Violent Extremism, what are the similarities and differences in those sort of programs and how have Muslim communities received and interacted with those programs in the two countries? I think they're very similar and I think some of the initiatives perhaps are replicated or borrowed from, particularly from England, where, you know, IRA uh, has been quite active in terror attacks for some time. And so they had that experience before Americans had and before we had, say, for example, in terms of Bali bombing. There's a uh, correlation between the initiatives taken here in Australia as well as in uh, US and UK. So I was involved in a number of counterterrorism programs and we had experts coming from FBI and CIA here in Australia as well as New Zealand and UK working together on this. Uh, and so there were programs, de-radicalization programs, counterterrorism initiatives, and it seemed to be fairly similar from one country to another. And so I think because of the collaboration happening between a number of countries that the initiatives practically was same counter-terror measures, the initiatives, de-radicalization, or uh, what kind of programs should uh, state initiate. For example, New South Wales was involved in a counter-terrorism program, which basically was to identify where possible terror Muslims lived and how could they be uh, identified and I suppose uh, prosecuted. And so the program basically was designed to, and you mentioned this earlier, to uh, see how Muslim communities can be persuaded to help the state, in this case, New South Wales police, to identify the culprits and bring them to justice, if you like. Michael, we've been looking at the United States briefly, examining the Australian history. 
Let's detour just again very briefly to another very different country, France, an intensely colonial country, as we're still seeing playing out in Niger in Africa. Of course, they had colonies in Africa and in the Pacific as well. And with a much higher Muslim population, just describe for us very briefly what's been happening in France, including things like the fact that they banned Muslim face coverings in 2011, bearing in mind, of course, that high-profile terrorist attack on the Charlie Hebdo office in Paris in 2015 and other related terrorist attacks in France. Just use France now as, a, as another point of comparison for us in terms of the war on terror and the life of Muslims. Uh, well, I mean, as you say, it's a complicated history in terms of its colonial past and uh, the Algerian War of Independence and the history of immigrant migration uh, from North Africa into France. I mean, first of all, terrorism in France has a long history and, you know, Middle East terrorism is only really the, the most recent. You know, there's been separatist kind of terrorism, there's been right-wing terrorism. And in fact, you know, in the 1990s, the Algerian civil war brought the kind of armed Islamic group, the GIA, into terrorist attacks in France. And in fact, the French developed a much better understanding of what was happening internationally through those attacks where they identified that people were going to Afghanistan and getting trained by Al-Qaeda. And apparently one of the people involved in the 9-11 attacks was identified with this kind of, you know, flight simulation training. And when they approached the French, they they warned them about these dynamics and they didn't take them seriously, unfortunately. And they didn't intervene and, and kind of grab his computer and see who he was in contact with. Anyway, so the French have their kind of own historical experience with terrorism, which is quite independent of 9-11. The question about French culture, I mean, it is a particular perspective on creation of the French citizen. I mean, in France, in the education system, people have kind of lessons that are synchronized. You know, you're taught particular topics and programs and lessons in unison across the country. There's a sense in which everybody is supposedly being integrated and formed as a French person, you know, within the overview of the and the support of the state. A Napoleonic legacy. Definitely. So it's not surprising that, you know, colonial attitudes about how to make people French involved taking away their cultural attachments. And so, you know, the hijab was was a focus of the liberation of women in colonial Algeria. I mean, it, this is not a new thing. And the difficulty is for Muslims in France is that the more radical attacks were targeting the French on French soil, the more the symbols of Islam became either radicalized or stigmatized. And so, you know, the question of the hijab became a symbol of extremism or a risk, or was this an expression of cultural autonomy? So these symbols just become extremely become politicized and difficult for people to conduct their ordinary lives. And John, speaking of symbology, I guess we in Australia find it uh, somewhat bewildering to see French police on beaches uh, getting people to uncover rather than cover up, coming from a slip, slap, slop sort of environment here in Australia with the intense sun. We'd find that very hard to be told to take our rashies off uh, and risk skin cancer. But of course, that is what's happening in France uh, to this day, I believe. So just looking at France and again, starting to come back to Australia and compare how we're dealing with these friction points and how they're dealing with them. In terms of the two nations treating Muslims any differently, I find it very interesting that France being a place where liberal democracy, this idea of French Revolution with the birth of human freedom took place, is uh, suddenly making a U-turn and stripping people of their freedom and things like that. And I don't think Australia has caught up to that yet. Uh, we still uh, allow our citizens a proper level of freedom, I suppose, and we haven't banned uh, hijab or niqab or anything like that, but France has done that. So I suppose there are some similarities, but also some differences. And as Michael was saying earlier, that France has had a 
more long term experience with Terra, whilst we don't have that here in Australia. And so this is one way of managing that, I suppose, in the French context. John, inherent in a robust and healthy democracy, which we still have in Australia to a fairly large degree, though it's being buffeted like democracies around the world, is that contest over values and the expression of values, values like free speech, open free speech, the role of women, homosexuality, etc., etc. Those values frameworks are in constant contest within our Australian democracy. Do you see that as a positive thing in terms of the othering and de-othering of our Muslim citizens? I think generally speaking, Islamic values and Australian values don't differ, uh, or Islamic values or Western values don't differ. Uh, there is no religion in my view that actually promotes violence, promotes the disharmony. And so these are the values that all religions value and preach, and modern democracies do the same. So I think it is an artificial demarcation that actually pits a religion, in this case Islam, against West in terms of values. I find that to be an implausible articulation about this idea that there is a difference in values and therefore we cannot work together. That's not really true. And I think we need to start appreciating the fact that these religious traditions actually harbour the same values that we in modern democracies do. And we should therefore work with each other, not against each other in saying that our value is different and therefore we are different. And even if we are different, different doesn't mean that we cannot work together. We can. And so as a civilized society, we can find ways of working together. And I think this is what needs to be done. Michael, how do you perceive these evident friction points around values, etc.? Uh, John's comment reminds me of a conversation I had with an imam a long time ago who said to me, look, you know, Muslim values or Islamic values and Australian values and care about, you know, for provision of welfare and hospitals and education, he said, they're very similar. In fact, you know, Australia's almost an Islamic country, <laughs> um, which would have surprised a lot of Australians. But, you know, I, I understood his point. But, you know, on the other side, I mean, you were mentioning questions about values in regard to, you know, homosexuality and more kind of liberal views about individual rights and behavior. You know, Islam is conservative in those matters, but so are many religions and some very punitively. So, well, I mean, you know, that will be a point of conflict. But, you know, in the US, you know, we see how these get politicized so that that whole idea of kind of individual rights and behavior now becomes stigmatized as woke and identified with a political party. So the danger with these questions about cultural values is the way they become politicized. And, you know, I mean, hopefully it doesn't develop in our politics, which is, you know, really quite worrying what you see what's happening in some Western countries. So to finish our conversation about Muslims growing up since 9-11, it's been 20 years. And Michael, as we look at our Australian political fabric here, things have shifted. The last uh, federal election saw over 30% of Australian citizens voting for a non-major political party. We had the rise of the community independence, and I don't think they're going away. So we're seeing a shift in the way people are seeing politics, and we're seeing, I think, uh, the splintering to some degree of the conservative side of politics, as given expression by the Liberal Party. We're seeing a lot of tensions and fissures there. So in that 20 years, things have changed politically and culturally within Australia. So taking a snapshot of today and trying to project forward into the future, what needs to be done and can be done to repair the damage done by the othering of Muslims within Australian society since 9-11? Look, I think the legacy will be what the future of the war on terror is, in the sense that Muslims in Australia found out that it wasn't just the domestic environments that would determine how they were going to be treated and how they were going to be viewed, but events overseas. 
is certainly since the defeat of IS and the demolition of the caliphate, the issue of Islam and radicalization has really receded. And I think, you know, the, the terror alert of New South Wales police is actually very low now. And the other point is it hasn't been recently the focus of political campaigns and the stigmatization process that you see very prominently in Europe with this kind of major focus on immigration and refugees and the right-wing parties stigmatizing Muslim communities and looking at them as a threat within. I mean, you know, much in the way that Trump introduced his Muslim ban um, when he characterized the Syrian refugees as a Trojan horse of kind of IS fighters coming in to take over Europe. So the domestic environments are very different. So in Australia, it appears that things have quietened down in terms of the dynamic of politics and how kind of Muslims are no longer a major focus. But in terms of the war on terror, unfortunately, it appears to be something that will be ongoing as a globalised form of politics. And, you know, the whole emergence of new forms of technological warfare, particularly drone warfare, which is active, you know, across Africa, West Africa, Somalia. Those are fairly distant from many of the communities in Australia. But that kind of link between external events and how people would be regarded will be a constant theme, I think, in the context of Australia and the contingency of where one sits and how one's regarded and the question of inclusion within Australian society. John, it has been 20 years since 9-11, so inevitably there's a generational forces at work in terms of younger people having grown up during that 20 years here in Australia. So the same question to you, what else needs to be done to repair the damage already done by the othering of Muslims within our society here in Australia? How do you view that? How optimistic are you? I'm cautiously optimistic, and I think the way forward would be to move away from othering Muslims to de-othering Muslims, which means that we have to start thinking about people in this country as all belonging to the nation state and that when we begin to isolate individual communities and start to otherize them, we are not solving anyone's problem. And in fact, we are creating a problem. And so we need to learn a lesson from this um, Muslim experience and move away from otherization. And if we are to engage in community building, society building, then we have to treat our citizens equally and equitably and make sure that they are all included in the decision-making process. And this is a positive for both the Muslims as well as the larger Australian society. And if we can do this, if we can take a more holistic approach and a more holistic attitude towards nation building and move away from playing politics or politicking, we will be able to make this country better. And I think Muslims will be more than willing to actually engage in that. This is something of a long-term process. And I think both the policymakers and politicians need to actually revisit their position so that there can be some modification in their attitude and their approaches. Michael, John, thank you for your time and for your insights today here on Ear to Asia. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Peter. Our guests have been Professor Michael Humphrey from the University of Sydney and Dr. Jan Ali from the University of Western Sydney. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find the show. And put in a good word for us in your socials. This episode was recorded on the 15th of August, 2023. Producers were Kelvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Peter Clark. Thanks for your company.